Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Super excited to be talking about the origins of humanity and technology. We have Charity Ever joining us on the show. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for coming on, Charity. Thank you for having me. It was so such a beautiful encounter that we had in Cambridge just in around January. And I learned about your project, Go Back Fetch It teaching about the origins of humanity, and I was immediately super excited about it, like we definitely need this in our world. And for those that don't know, Charity, and you were here actually visiting the Bay Area, which is why we're now able to, uh, you were at AWE and you won the award, which is now on the table. We'll get to that in a moment. Charity's background, she's a creative technologist, storyteller, performer, and research fellow at MIT's Open Documentary Lab and Harvard's Derek Box Center for Teaching and Learning. She explores the connection between humanity and technology. Her augmented reality storytelling project, Go Back Fetch, it explores the origins of the human race, and in a collaboration with the Ministry of Tourism of Tunisia, she's bringing to life the ancient mosaics of the Barbo Museum, and most recently is the winner of the 2019 Nextent Prize Rising Star Award from the Virtual World Society, and that is the Nobel Prize of Virtual Worlds. You can find all the links in the bio below to her Patreon, gobackfetchit.com, as well as her Twitter profile. So huge congrats on winning the award, and this was at the Augmented World Expo. Right? Yes. At AWE. Mm -hmm. and um, it's awesome that you're here and that we're able to do this show together now. One of our favorite questions to ask our guests is, what are your thoughts on the direction of our world? I think the direction of our world is whatever we make it and whatever energy we put out into the universe and whatever we decide to put our attention and energy toward is what's going to be amplified and brought back toward us. So it's very necessary that we keep in the positive mindset and look at all of the good things, the good strides that are being made and focus our intention on what we're doing right and how we can continue to amplify that. And what would you say are some of the most important um, principles to be able to put our energy towards? Connection, bridging gaps, um, actually opening up and communicating, going deeper, um, not allowing things that have in the past separated us to continue to separate us because in the end, when you come down to it, everything, all of those things are actually just illusions. The interconnectedness and the unity is the truth. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is why <laughs> I love you so much. This is going to be so great. All right. <laughs> Um, let's do the journey. Okay, so born in Wiesbaden, Germany? Wiesbaden. Wiesbaden, Germany, <laughs> until six, and then you went to Florida, and then New Mexico, and then Boston for school. Yes. Who were you as a kid growing up? I was an avid reader. I read literally everything constantly all the time. Um, I excelled academically and at sports. Um, I was always kind of a type A personality where I would you know, put my mind to something and then I would just go completely overboard and get completely obsessed with it and, and throw myself into it wholeheartedly. And that spanned a lot of different ranges. When I was in eighth grade, I, I went from, uh, from self-teaching myself to calligraphy. And then that summer I self-taught myself ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. Um, so just like that, just kind of like a mind that's constantly thinking about new ways that it can stretch itself and I would just get interested in so many topics that at the time they seemed like they were just so random and so all over the place and now I'm kind of seeing that it's my um, I guess my diverse array of interests have all kind of converged into one project that kind of is able to encompass everything. You self-taught yourself Egyptian hieroglyphics? I did, and the funny thing about that was, like, I, I went online and there was this, like, online tutorial that you could go through, and, like, it would, it would teach you, like, phonetically, but then also, like, the pictographic meaning, because, like, they can be read both ways. And I remember going through it and thinking, like, okay, I don't know if this is actually true, like, I could, this could be teaching me nonsense and I would have no way of knowing. And so when I was in high school, um, I, I was able to paint my room. And so like I painted my room like it was ancient Egypt. And like this is still the, the room at my dad's house. And like on, um, on the wall, I wrote my name. I wrote like Charity Everett's room on my wall in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. Because my little sister would keep coming into my room. And so when she'd come into my room, I'd be like, what does that say on the wall? And like, you know, I'd kind of throw that in her face. So it was kind of funny when um, I, I started kind of like working on this project and I, I ended up on the radar of the head of Egyptology at Harvard. And my dad went and took a picture of my room, and I was like, okay, now I'll know for sure. And so I showed it to him, and he actually read the hieroglyphics in my name. And I was like, okay, so that means I wasn't being taught nonsense on the internet. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, what a way to also get an in into like 
epic people at like Harvard that yeah, you're just like, oh, I've already self-taught myself Egyptian hieroglyphics. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, and then um, so then it was Harvard, and that's still where you're you're at. Is this one more year right now? 2020 is the last year of the. Uh um, yes. So I was going to Harvard for my undergrad, but then I discovered VR and AR, and I started self-teaching myself, and I stopped taking classes because um, I was just kind of like outpacing what um, was being able to be taught in schools at that point in time, and I started making my own stuff. Um, and so right now what I have are fellowships. Um, so I have Whoa. a fellowship at MIT and a fellowship at Harvard. Yeah, that's, that's cool. So it's like the university system will recognize that people want to like self-teach at like their own pace technologies and then they'll like bring them in as fellows um so some so it's like a different track in a sense it's mm -hmm. like more more possibility spaces are opening up for for students to collaborate with universities mm -hmm. um and then what was it about like ar that you were like oh my gosh or just like just mixed reality in general um that you were just like this is such an important medium that i need to self-teach myself and use for storytelling yeah so originally i was going to school for digital media because i always knew that storytelling is what i wanted to do i always knew that the stories that i wanted to tell were very big and large in scope um i really wanted to show people to connect the dots between um things that didn't seem like they were connected to people even if they happened a long time ago or even if they're happening on the other side of the world and like i was i I was trying to think about the way that I wanted to tell this story. Um, I knew I, it was going to be allegorical, probably in nature. Um, I was considering, like you know, graphic novels, like stop motion animation, like some sort of interactive. Like I didn't exactly know what the medium I wanted to use was, but I knew the story that I wanted to tell, and I knew that the way I had it in my mind, like it wouldn't just work in any like form that I'd ever really seen, experienced before. And so when was I first it always the origins of humanity. It wasn't as much the origins of humanity as much as it was kind of um, kind of like reframing all of these kind of like preconceived notions that we have in the world. Like I, I have a concept that I, I myself kind of call like invisible walls or invisible scaffolding, where it's like there's all of this kind of like. Um, like when it comes to like being a part of a society or a part of a culture, there are so many things that come baked into it that you don't even realize that like are, are these preconceived notions that you have about like what the world is and what life is and what it looks like. And it's, it's like the, these invisible walls that are up around you. Um, and so I always was interested in using media um, and especially like, you know, in this form of entertainment and story to kind of um, like shine lights in the cracks of those um, invisible walls. Because it's one of those things where like once you actually realize the crack is there, then the whole thing kind of starts to lose structural integrity and it gets easier and easier to start like chipping away at the wall. But first you have to be shown that that first crack. Okay. Okay, okay, and then continue us on the, yeah, on using the, the mixed reality pursuit as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, so when I first discovered VR and AR, I was like, oh my God, this is it. This is the, this is the medium that mm -hmm. like, I, I can use in order to tell this story. Um, it could be really engaging. It could connect with people on a lot of different levels because it's so immersive. It's something that people could really lose themselves inside of if it were ex executed correctly. Um, and so that's why I got really obsessed with just learning as much as I could about it. And then after I felt like I'd learned enough and I I'd, I'd rolled up my sleeves and done enough. I felt comfortable enough to start working on my own project. Nice. Okay, so it, there's a process of, of self-teaching yourself. Is it unity is mm -hmm. what you're self-teaching yourself? Mm -hmm. And then the also the process of um, figuring out exactly how you wanted to tell the story mm -hmm. of finding the kind of like cracks in, in a culture that needed to shine a light in for us to better understand reality. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and then... Um, so now, okay, so now walk us through like the reason why um, indigenous wisdom mm -hmm. with this Go Back Fetch It, with the project that you're doing, why is it so critical? Well, for me, um, this project is, it, it covers a lot of themes, but one of the main themes that it really covers is the, the idea that like we're at a point where we're birthing the, the, we're birthing an entirely new medium and every aspect of it, like um, how, how it functions and also the storytelling aspect of it. And so when I started to think about like Go Back Fetch It and what this project was and what it would mean, um, the idea of the, the ethos of it, you know, Go Back and Fetch It really started um, recursing throughout the entire project. And I realized that if what we're talking about is birthing stories 
storytelling in a new medium, then we have to go back and examine the origins of storytelling in all mediums. And if you're doing that, then what you're really looking at is indigenous wisdom. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, and then how then was it, so then the, then the moment came where you were, I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna use the augmented reality technology to tell the story of the sto of origins of humanity. Then that was kind of the light bulb moment of so um, this project, when I first started it, I started as a part of an artist in residency that I had um, at this place called Industry Lab in Cambridge. And when I first pitched this as a project, um, I, I pitched it as being very different in form, but the, 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 the end goal was the same. So originally, um, I was going to get um, this Sankofa image tattooed onto my stomach, um, and when you scan the tattoo, I was going to turn into a visualization in the shape of a tree with like branches growing out of my head, um, and the different branches would represent different data points, and when you interacted with a piece of fruit on one of the branches, it was going to turn into this animated moving data visualization, um, and then it was going to turn into this actual like personal anecdote about how that data point impacted me as an individual. And the data points that I was dealing with were the global impacts of the transatlantic slave trade. And, mm -hmm. and so I was at first examining it from an economic perspective, just like looking at, um, if you look at all of the, the shipping routes that we have, how they run across the world, like that actually, they refine that process through figuring out how to effectively ship people off of the coast of Africa to where they were sending them. Um, if you look at the fact that the, the US is a first world country right now because they ended up with hundreds of years of free labor and how much of that money you know, went back to Europe and you know, why, those, the, their, why the, you know, the British monarchy is as wealthy as it is is because of colonialism and even like looking at where we are now if you look at the major export of the United States, our major export is actually culture. And if you actually look at the origins of so much, pretty much all of American culture, it all really comes back to um, African American. Um, if you look at actually the origins of pretty much all music, um, even if you look back to something that you would never even think to tie to um, people of African descent is rock and roll music. Um, there's a woman, Sister Rosetta Tharp, who only just last year was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and she He's the inventor of rock and roll music. Um, and there's actually this video that you can pull up on YouTube. It's the craziest thing you'll ever watch. It's in black and white. There's this woman, like this, this you know, middle-aged African-American woman who like get, gets out of this horse and carriage and she struts out onto these railroad tracks and she picks up an electric guitar and she just starts going to town. And this is when Elvis Presley was in diapers. Um, and one of the uh, another so like that's just something that you would never even like think about those are the the origins but if you would think about another aspect hip-hop music or just hip-hop culture in general right it's one of those things that has gone completely global i had this roommate who was from bulgaria and i when i was starting to work on this project and he was telling me oh yeah we have rappers in bulgaria and like it's one of those things where no matter where the person is from, that's something that has that that that, that has reached every corner of the planet. Like every I don't want to say corner because people think the earth is flat. Every aspect of the planet, um, and it. It's something that 100% only exists because in the 1970s, these oppressed African-American people in the Bronx felt that they needed to start expressing themselves in this very specific way. So they, they started you know, using music that they'd always listened to and started like scratching it and remixing it and then started like kind of just like rhyming on top of it, like whatever they were feeling and expressing themselves. And this is a method of expression that has be become, become so woven into the bedrock of American culture. And because it's a part of American culture and it's one of our major exports, it's become in, in woven into the bedrock of the global culture as well. And then if you think about how much money has actually been made on hip hop music since the 1970s, and then you think about how, how many people are, who created or originated it or the originators of it, who's actually holding that wealth, you start to actually look at how big of a disparity it is and how these things that people want to think happened hundreds of years ago and don't affect us are still, the, you know, the injustice is continuing to recurse throughout history to this day. These are where some of the the dues, the, the the taxes that we have to pay for some of the um, malevolences that we've caused on 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 the spirit of other humans on the planet. These are some of the things that really have to be well integrated and really honestly met, like really honestly met. Um, it's, an, it's a very complicated thing, and it's it's good that you're highlighting so many of these for us to see. Mm -hmm. um, 
Okay, let's let's go. Let's get into this um, the origins because you you're like you're you're constantly pointing at like the origin, right? This is what you're doing. You're pointing at mm -hmm. the origin and showing how it gets like exported around the world and how other people get. So let's like that theme is such a reoccurring theme and the origins of humanity start in the African continent. Yes. Okay. This is where. Yes. Take us. Take us. Um, yeah. So uh, when I so. That was, that, that was how I had originally conceived of the project. But as I started to research it, um, it occurred to me that anytime any, anyone wants to talk about the continent of Africa, they always want to talk about it within the context of slavery. And that only takes into account the last 500 years, but what about the hundreds of thousands of years before that? And what about the entirety of the human race that happened before that? And so I realized that if I was going to tell the story, then I had to go all the way back to the beginning. And then I wouldn't just be telling my story. I would be telling everyone's story. And then that's why the character of Eve became very depersonalized for me. And she became more of this um, mythological you know, foremother of the human race that everybody can kind of connect with and get behind. Um, everyone's superheroine origin story. Yeah, and that's... Um that's right, yeah, right here. Mm -hmm. Eve is a woman who is on a journey that spans the arc of human history. By accompanying her through the quintessential struggles and triumphs that we have built upon to this day, we explore the themes of what makes us all human. So, on, so, the, we're, so we go on a journey with Eve mm -hmm. through what was a project about our shared origin stories and what makes us human. Yes. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So Eve, um, okay, so yeah, teach us more about like, how'd you pick like a character to like be accompanying, accompanied through the journey? Um, well, so I always realized that if you're going to tell a story and like even though the story always was rooted in like data storytelling and data visualization, um, in order for it to actually have impact and to connect with people, what people really care about are human stories. They care about the connection between us. They care about you know them being able to see themselves in the data points that are being represented, or you know to actually see themselves represented in order to actually feel it. We think in stories. We've always thought in stories. That's one of the reasons why you know fairy tales are so effective. You know you can tell a kid, oh, don't go and go and jump in the lake and they might jump in the lake anyway. But if you tell a kid, oh, there was a little boy who jumped in the lake and a monster came out and got him and all this other stuff, you think that kid's gonna go jump in the lake? No, because they have this you know, image in their head of what's actually gonna happen um, if they engage in that activity. And so I always knew that there would have to be a centralized character. And when I was choosing the character, it only made sense for me to, because the, the one of the points of this project is to challenge a lot of people's preconceived notions. Yeah. Um, it was like, it should be a super heroine, it should be a heroine's st journey, you know? Why is it always a hero's journey? And like, what would you think about when, you, when I decided to come up with the name, Eve was the only thing that came to mind because she is the first human, you know, mm. the first human woman. Mm. But then it's also like, what do people actually think of when they think of Eve versus like the anthropological evidence that we have on what Eve would have actually looked like based yeah. on where the yeah. origins yeah. of the yeah. human race started. And like, even just in through that, I'm already starting to like, chip away at like, it never would have occurred to me that like yeah. Eve would probably be African, you know? And so um, that that kind of like having that lens on everything really um, informed every aspect of what Go Back Fetch It has turned into. Yeah, there's in so many regards, we are caught in our, in our egos and especially um, men that have lots of power in government and in corporations are caught in their egos and not connected to the spirit, this mother energy that is what sustains us, mm -hmm. the planet. And, and especially having a really true perspective on the origins of humanity, having a, as, and this is what projects like this do is they give us that true sense of our interconnectedness. I'm happy that you that you could the woman's Eve that takes us on the journey. Okay, and then we have we have a video about this. It's the first video. It's of what, people using the technology in the project, the augmented reality technology, and they're so excited mm -hmm. in this video. Wow! Oh, awesome! <laughs> yeah. You, have you done it yet? No. Uh, Uh huh. Wow. Yeah. That's so cool. So, so in the video, thank you. No way. You have, you have, you have a, you have what is a static 
image of Africa and then with the humans here on it. Mm -hmm. And then what happens when they open it up right here as Ron's showing us is that once they bring it up on their smartphone that you can actually see them moving. Mm -hmm. The movement comes up. Yeah, so teach us about what this, what this is like. What are they using on their phone? Um, how did you have the static image ena enable um, the movement be enabled on the static image? Yeah. Um, yeah, so this was quite a process. And like that was the initial tech demo that I made. Um, and that was their reaction. They, they'd clearly never seen anything like that before. And that was a wonderful reaction um, to, to experience. Um, so basically like I, I trained I had software that I trained and I said when you see this image do this thing okay. um, what you're actually seeing um, is I think that there's a, a slide later on that kind of shows more about it the way that it was actually created yeah mm -hmm. um, so we actually pull that up um, so the slide that's on NDI right now um, will show what um, the style elements that Charity is talking about. So mm -hmm. Ron will get that up and then, okay, yeah. yeah so break so it if out. you look at the top here, um, so we actually, we shot it on a green screen. Um, so that's me and um, another person. We filmed it on a green screen. So that's actually human beings. Um, there were some animation elements. So we, we edited it using um, normal like Adobe tools, um, edited it together with, with audio or with, um, those effects, um, we told it when you see this image, overlay this on top of it. Um, and again, this is just the early tech demo. There's more and more um, interactivity that's laid, that's layered into it. Um, but that was the kind of like the way that I decided to visually represent telling the story. And even that des deciding to go with um, flat over three dimensional was kind of like a throwback mm. to where it's like, okay, again, we're at the beginning of the storytelling technology. So instead of trying to make everything all, you know, super flashy and bright and colorful and three dimensional and look super future like let's make it look as old school as possible yeah. and let's look, use as old school tools as possible and see you know how interesting that that would yes, actually look yes. juxtaposed with such a futuristic technology. technology that's such a funny juxtaposition it's so yeah. rugged yeah it's the OG civilization mm -hmm. and black and white 2d on uh, the 2019 technology use it's a very interesting juxtaposition mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and then what do you do um, with the, the, the smartphone itself, just do I enter into a specific app that enables my camera mm -hmm. to sense the, Im the, the image and then create that? Mm -hmm. How, yeah. Yeah, so right now it is through an app. Um, in the future, uh, I would, it would be something that would actually be able to work in your browser so you wouldn't have to download an app. Cool. But currently it is app-based technology. And what is the app download? So, um, so you can go to the download by going to gobackfetchit.com slash download okay. and you can get it there. Okay, cool. So gobackfetchit.com forward slash download, download it. And then where can, can they still find these up to play with around like Boston or anywhere that they can go and they, um, oh yeah. So if you just subscribe to my Patreon account, um, we actually do have, um, things that we can send you that you can actually interact oh, with this sweet. and so, you'll be able to okay. see it as it evolves as well. Oh, okay, like I can get a digital image of it and then use my, use the app, the camera, and, mm -hmm. and then... And physical as well. And phys I can print them and set them up inside my... Something like that. Something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All right. And then, and then, um, you have, you have, you have a, um, the, what is this, the Adding, adding Adinkra symbols? Adinkra. Oh, so if you go okay. back to the last slide, I can yes. talk more about the style elements. Okay. Um, okay, so image-based augmented reality. We filmed it on a green screen, made it look like charcoal drawings. Um, but the world itself is made out of Adinkra symbols. Um, so if you look at the sun and the palm tree there, um, and actually if we could just go ahead and play the, the a short video clip of what, what you actually plays when you scan it. And that's the, sec the story, the that's story the second portion. one, this mm -hmm. one? Yeah, okay, yep. cool. All right. This is the story of a young woman living in a time before our own. In a world made out of ancient wisdom. Um, yeah, so you, as you can see there, those are the, the two Adinkra symbols that actually make up the different aspects of the world. Um, and so the, the world itself is going to continue to be made up of these types of symbols. Okay. 
Um, and so we can go back to the style elements. Okay, okay, I see, I see. So mm -hmm. um, the Adinkra um, um, symbols are act mm -hmm. as, um, uh, and that was that was the kind of the next stages. You have these two. You have these two um, characters. Even what's the? Is there another? Adam. Adam. Even oh, Adam. cool. Even <laughs> Adam. That are that are that are walking. And then in the next one, you see the Adinkra symbols coming up. The sun and the palm. To, Oh, yeah. so what you get is the intro into the into the world, and into actually world. that okay. that demo um, is what plays at the end of the video, like when you, okay. when you watch it. Um, okay. But so these are different; these are Adinkra symbols, um, and they actually they're Ghanaian, okay. um, and they embody different aspects of humanity. And they're I, I, I chose them because they're they're contextually and also visually very rich, um, in order to build uh, to build a world on top of. And it's also again it's 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 a it's a written language that a lot of people don't know anything about. However, yeah. if you spend any amount of time with African people, you actually see these symbols constantly. Um, and if you go to the next slide, wait, can you teach uh, us about these? They're so cool. Like, sure. like the, yeah. I love these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, like just a few of them. Sure. Okay. Um, so uh, this one, uh, the symbol means beauty. Um, this symbol is Akoma Untosa. This one down here? Yeah, that one means beauty. Okay. Um, this is Akoma Untosa. That means like linked hearts, linking hearts together. This one, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, this one um, was actually like a, like a hairstyle that royalty wore. Um, if you come down, this one, ah, like that was a, a warrior symbol, a symbol of warriors. Um, this one, oh my mm -hmm. gosh. But yeah. can you teach us about the heart symbols? Yeah. Um, so actually, one of the one of the main heart symbols. If you go oh, up. Okay. Um, uh huh. Yeah. Up, 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 up. Yeah. So this is actually one oh, of cool. the sincofas. Okay. And so if you go to the next slide, um, I'll teach okay. you about the sincofa. Oh my gosh, these are so cool. The fact that we can actually use symbols to communicate that we're so far away from that now, mm. like these beautiful symbols. Well, I mean, yeah. what are emojis? That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's right. But it just seems as though, like, what can, like, these styles, yeah, yeah, this is different. This is, like, it's a, a emoji set that has yet to be, yeah, 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 okay, all right. Mm -hmm. Keep going. <laughs> um, but what yeah. are emojis? What's your response? <laughs> it's true, right? It's true, you can yeah. have an entire conversation yeah. with emojis. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so so go to the next one. Okay. okay, so yeah, so one of these, so one of the main symbols is the Sankofa, and this is actually what the, the project itself is based Sankofa. off of. Mm -hmm. okay. And it's, that's the image is actually present down there in the trigger image. Um, and so that actually means go back and fetch it. So it means, oh. um, yeah, so it means we deal with the past before we move into the future. And the Sankofa is actually the only symbol that has, or it's the only one that has two symbols that mean the same thing. So one of them is a bird flying forward, um, turned backwards with an egg in its mouth. Huh. Um, and that definitely embodies that concept Go of back, like, fetch it. Yeah, or you know, okay. to protect, um, to protect what's to come. Oh, what's you okay. have to like, you have to look back, but keep moving forward. And it's like you look back to understand the origins. Right, and and you look back with the future in mind. In mind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, in great. order to protect. Oh, the I future. love this. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so beautiful. Yeah, and it's actually kind of funny because um, the, the I, I realized that I was reading up on the symbology that's used by the Virtual World Society that's actually mm -hmm. present in, in the awards that they give me, and it's on their logo, and it's kind of something similar where it's like, you know, you have this older person, and they're like lifting up a child, oh, and the child yeah. is looking backwards, but they're looking forward and looking, you know, forward to the future. Um, so it's like, I guess, the nature of recursion, right? Recursion, Everything yeah. just kind of ends up coming full circle and coming back, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow, this, so usually when we're born, we're born with such a, you know, present and future, but to actually be able to oh, l love our origins as well as understand the present future is so, so crucial. Um, okay, so, by the way, how did you discover this um, Ghanaian uh, symbol, symbol, symbol language? How did you? So again, if you spend any amount of time with African people, like you'll see it, like you'll see it on earrings, you'll see it on bags, you'll see it on clothing. And you know, you'll get to ask like, oh, what is that? Like, what does that mean? Like, where does it come from? And people are more than happy to tell you, to tell you about it. And I just, as, as I started to learn more and more about it, I realized that, you know, this made a lot of sense to be, you know, the anchor for the project that I was working on about, you know, connecting dots and, you know, dealing with the origins of Africa and origins of everyone and. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. All mm -hmm. right. 
Oh, so yeah, this is more just about you know the the other aspects of the world. So you know the Adinkra Hene, which is the sun, a chief of the Adinkra symbols, symbol of greatness, charisma, and leadership. Um, the Abe Dua, the palm tree, it's a symbol of wealth, self -suffici sufficiency, and vitality. Um, and so you'll continue to see these symbols weaved throughout the world as the backdrop. And I see this as kind of like the. Um, so, so a lot of uh, the, the context of what I'm doing is like layering um, different types of information on different layers and different levels. So even though you're paying attention to the story that's unfolding, there's other types of learning or even um, subconscious, um, I don't know, what's that, that term? Like when you're osmosis, unconscious osmosis that's happening. And because that's one of the reasons that symbols are so effective is because like even if you don't have the word for what it is, like on some level you kind of understand what's being represented. Um, and so this being weaved into the backdrop of the world around you, as well as you know data, data visualizations being weaved into the back drop backdrop of the world around you as well. This is also so grounding to nature. I mean, the symbols themselves are very grounding into nature. The sun gives us life. The trees around us are interconnected with us. What we inhale, they exhale. What they exhale, we inhale. You know, it's just like such a, it's all so interconnected. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this, this is life. This is where we come from. It's just, I can obsessively rant about the importance <laughs> of this, but I'll let you keep going. Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, so here, um, the, 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 what you're seeing, what you've been seeing clips of so far is the prologue. Um, so I already have the next four um, parts, episodes of it mapped out along the different major technological advancements of the human story. Yes. Um, so technological advancement <clears throat> one being when humans discover how to make fire. Um, and if you actually stop and think about it, um, the discovery of fire was the first major technological advancement, but it also had biological implications. Yeah. Um, actually having access to consistent cooked meats allowed our brains to develop faster. And after that, like, you know, the advancement started happening a lot more rapidly. And now here we are on simulation series um, talking about augmented reality reality you know um, and, and the warmth um, the mm -hmm. protection from uh, from uh, the, at night to be able to see just protection from other uh, mm -hmm. animals and stuff so many aspects of fire just traject just change the trajectory of civilization one of the great things to be able to do is to actually go back and try and immerse ourselves in the felt experience of the humans that actually made the discoveries those there's some of my favorite stuff to be able to do and hopefully we can do that when we get the technological capacity to run simulations and get behind people's eyes and stuff like that mm -hmm. so Technological advancement too was evolution of hunting tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how we went from using rocks to using spears, to using atlatls, to bows and arrows. And bows and arrows always came um, right when civilizations were really, you know, starting to rise. Um, agriculture, like you know, evolving the hunt or uh, evolving the the farming tools, um, so that we were able to do, you know, constant, you know, stay in one space, or even like evolving to the point of. Um, hey, I like eating this. I would like the idea of consistently being able to eat this. Let's stop walking around and let's put down roots and let's actually build a civilization. Um, and so like by, through marking these different phases of the human story, I'm also, I'm also um, connecting human evolution with the evolution of technology yes. and showing that like technology isn't something that happens on the outside of us. Technology isn't something that certain select people do. It's something that we've always done. It's what makes us human. We would not be where we are today if we hadn't always just intrinsically been able to work with the elements and the tools that were around us to create new and better. Like that is literally what technology is. Yeah, being born into the the laptop and smartphone age, it's hard to look back and be like, these are technologies as well that helped us advance. That's a critical component of this. Okay. Yeah. Um. So getting into uh, the data visualization aspects of it. So um, again, like the ethos of this project is about. Um, so I, I have a tagline. I'm, I'm challenging consist, consensus. Re I'm using extended reality to challenge consensus reality. And mm. like I said about putting that crack in the invisible wall, um, this right here is a case in point about, you know, a lot of people don't even realize that the map that we've been taught our entire lives is so drastically skewed from anything anything about what the world actually looks like. Um, and so this is a visualization that actually shows how large Africa is, 11.73 million square miles, and all of the countries that fit inside of it. That is the UK, that is Japan, that is Ireland, that is China, that is, that is um, India, that is all of Eastern Europe, the US, Germany, 
France and Portugal all fit within the borders of Africa with room to spare. And um, I actually, it, Africa is 11.73 million square miles. The moon is 14.6 million square miles. Africa is 80% of the size of the moon. Um, and I actually have a visualization here, which the GIF isn't playing, but um, mm -hmm. I actually wrapped Africa around the moon. So you could see that for scale for yourself to actually like take that, that statistic in. That's something that you're never actually shown. Um, and so one of the things that I'm doing is I'm layering in these interactive data visualizations. I'm layering in these different maps and I'm also connecting it to documentary um, and one of the things that I did is I actually produced a documentary with the head of geospatial mapping at Harvard University where she kind of goes into some of that backstory about the Mercator projection. And we have that video that's the third asset that we can bring in right now and it was great hearing her also mention some of the, 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 the what, why we had it 500 years ago and what, what is the updates now that we're... It's about what the historical it. purpose of the Mercator projection is. And people have adopted it because historically that's what we had to do, that's what we had to work with. But people use it in a way that it was never intended. It's supposed to be used for navigation because it made straight lines. The problem is when taking an object that is round, i.e. the Earth, and attempting to represent on something flat, i.e. a map, it has traditionally resulted in distortions, either in area or shape. You start using it for other things without explaining the distortions that are in it, then there's not enough scholarly rigor in there. It leads to a misleading representation. I mean, that's, that's all there is to it as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and this is a very classic thing that we're taught, which is the Mercator map in schools. And then usually if you have excellent teachers, they'll also mention that this is distorted. Like Antarctica does not span the entire bottom of the map, and like Greenland is not the same size as Africa. It's 14 times smaller than Africa. Mm. And also Africa is right on the, you know, the equator going through the, the Sahara. Um, it's, just a, it's just like a... It's so massive, fitting U U.S., China, and all these other countries in it. I have a lot of other questions that I want to ask you about it. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to, I wanted you to um, maybe explain the the trajectory of our uh, exploration. Yes, as well. yes, absolutely. Um, and so one of the things that I do um, is I, I I layer or I, I put together um, different types of visualization. So I actually have a visualization that is the um, one that we just saw about like all the countries that fit inside of Africa, but it also mixes the human migratory patterns. Of course, this is according to National Geographic. Mm -hmm. um, um, there is some contention about how people actually ended up in the Americas, that people, uh, Japanese people came over on boats a really long time ago. And then there is evidence that um, a really long time ago, people came over from Africa and ended up in South America as well. Um, but the um, agreed upon route by um, National Geographic and uh, th those such scholars is that people just walked um, and migrational drift happened over a very long time for the, people walking across land bridges. The Bering Strait over, mm -hmm. yeah. The because it's only like 50 miles or something. It's so small, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it freezes over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so uh, this is according to the three different you know haplotypes, the groups that the, the different directions that they took, um, how long they walked, when they decided to stop walking is pretty much all that comes down to all of these differences that we try to act like are such a big deal. It's like literally like no, your ancestors were like this is about good. I'm gonna stop walking here, and then yeah. they sat down and put up culture, and then like yeah. over time people started looking differently and things shifted and changed a little bit. Even though if you actually start looking into the core. Um, I was actually just in Tunisia a few weeks ago, and it was so interesting to me as you're walking around these ancient places, realizing how many things you look at that and you're like, wait, but that looks like that belongs in Europe, and that looks like something I would see in Russia, and that looks like something I would see in South America, and it's like, no, it's just that those are the things that kind of like got imprinted or got taken over when people left, um, and then like those became kind of like the seeds of this new culture, but everything, literally everything has the same origins. And during that stage of exploration, it's like you're exploring and then it's like, yeah, this is good. Let's plant here and let's, uh, mm -hmm. let's, uh, let's build here. Mm -hmm. And the interconnectedness, like you said, yeah, you see it across the world like that. It's so important to get out of the United States and go and engage with other places in the world. Um, okay, let's hit... Um, yeah, there's some of the cave drawings that you have. 
mm -hmm. throughout. Yeah, so um, that was one of the ideas that uh, informed the visual style of, you know, go back, fetch it, go back to the beginnings of, of written or visual storytelling, obviously. If we're talking about visual storytelling now in three dimensions spatially all around you, what was the very beginning of visual storytelling? It was on the walls of caves. So like, let's let's mimic that in the, in the visual style and in, in the theme of um, yes. what's being presented. Um, by Greek mythology, by actually um, myth mythologizing the character, right? Because like that was the way that, like, if you look at the, the origins of like you know all really stories, it was always these really epic stories where it was like this one larger than life character who was going on this ridiculous journey that like you know through it they pretty much like had to they had to atone for all of humanity's sins and faults and and vanquish the enemy at the end. Um, so like re returning to that idea um, with us like having this one centralized woman character of Eve who's actually going through all of these phases and having to push forward and make that next leap for humanity herself. Um, and classic film. Uh, so this is actually from uh, George Millet's A Clip to the Moon. I don't, that's something that's not as widely known, um, it, but everyone pretty much knows that image, but a lot of people don't know what it's from. And it was from a film that um, was produced in 1912 by this, um, uh, this director. Well, he was actually um, a magician. He was involved with prestidigitation, and then he was drawn, right when filmmaking came out, he, kept, he got really um, inspired by the idea of being able to trick people's minds. It was, to him, it was a new type of magic. Um, and so he was really, really good at creating these, um, you know, these visually stunning, like really just like magical worlds that had like, you know, simplicity and wonderment. And so I wanted to kind of recapture that, that same feeling with um, the look and style of the film as well. Mm -hmm. And this is more of it. Like, you know, you, you would have actually like, you know, hand painted things. Mm -hmm. That's the video we already watched. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, the educational potential. Yeah, um, so the, the, where I actually see this project going is I see um, the story and art of Go Back, Fetch It as being a portal into this universe. Um, but once you're inside of this universe, you can follow your own path to learning and actually connecting the dots between other interactive and documentary projects that people are working on and ser serving um, as portals into their worlds that they're building out into what they're exploring. And this could continue to happen exponentially and exponentially until you layer in infinite amounts of information into this whole universe yeah their information retention is huge mm -hmm. yeah. yeah absolutely especially if you can follow your own path um, and so yeah that's pretty much the end of these slides. Oh, um, this is just work that I'm doing with the Bardo Museum in uh, Tunisia. They have these beautiful um, ancient mosaics. So this one is actually Ulysses um, crash, crossing the Mediterranean. Um, all of the all of the people on a ship have wax in their ears. He's listening, but they tied him to the post so that he doesn't so that he can listen to the songs of the siren without actually going into the rocks. Um, I was standing in front of this ancient mosaic. It looks just as beautiful as this to this day. Um, and so I'm going to be working with them to bring things like this to life so that people can experience it and actually experience a lot of the history that's in Tunisia. A lot of people don't even realize that Carthage um, is located in Tunisia. A lot of people think it's located in Spain or it's located in Italy because they had so much trade with Rome, but no, it's located in, in Northern Africa. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a lot there is a lot of ruins that literally look like they're from like a movie set from Rome or something that you can just like walk up to and like be around and touch and stare out at the Mediterranean Ocean. And there's just so many uh, misconceptions about that part of the world. And so we're trying to bridge that gap using this new technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that seems like um, museums uh, and ancient um, artifact archives are going to want to leverage uh, augmented reality and other new technologies to be able to um, get people to retain the origins of, yeah, of where we come from. Yeah, it's very useful. Mm -hmm. um, Okay. Yeah, this was something that was actually really interesting to me. Um, so a lot of their work that they have um, is very, very geometric. So like this here is like obviously like early cubism, like it does this mm -hmm. kind of like changed perspective thing. If you look at it one way, it looks like a cube. If you look at it another way, it looks like, you know, it looks like a, a six sided star, you know, and like when I was looking at it and it's switching back and forth in my mind, like auto automatically I thought about MC Escher and like how this is someone that, you know, a lot of people give, obviously like his work is amazing, but it's like, you know, this wasn't that long ago he was making this work. These people were making this work thousands of years ago. Um, um, and they were doing it in a really interesting way. They were taking 
three-dimensional objects, because mosaics are three-dimensional objects, they're taking a three-dimensional concept of a cube, of so this you know, hypercube, um, they're taking this three-dimensional thing, they're mushing it down um, and representing it in two, dimensional, in two dimensions, but with three-dimensional objects. And so I want to use AR to actually like, when you go there, you're actually seeing this stuff extruded out into the world around you, and you're seeing just how cubic it is and how geometric it is, but you're still getting that signature mosaic style to interact with as well. Just the sheer amount of complicated uh, time that it took humans to, to do this is just as humbling, and we need to be more grateful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, and these are just more examples of things that I thought were you know, visually interesting. Um, yeah. yeah. There's so many things that I want to talk that I want to talk to you about. Um, one of them is um, I'm going to go back to your actually this. I think this one's your like we can leave this one up for for um, for parts of the conversation that we have now. I want to hit on this with you. Um, there's so much of what you're doing with um, go back fetch it is. Um, so critical to for us to understand indigenous wisdom and our origins. That's so important. We have a, right now we have a massive disconnection from our origins and it's very visible in civilizations errors and issues that we have and the more we connect to that spirit of nature the more we can fix a lot of the errors that we have consciously not band-aids not second order solutions but some first principled solutions so we had a very massive amount of trauma um, with what we did with the transatlantic slave trade um, that still needs to be um, properly addressed and actually talked about and healed uh, as a planet. Um, there seems to be, there was already a scramble for Africa that happened in the past and it looks like there's going to be another scramble for Africa that's happening in the future. And I would like to hear your thoughts about, about that and how to best, you know, be really uh, true to the origins of, of that land and true to the native indigenous people of that land and not economically plundering that land. Yeah, geez, I mean, honestly, leave them alone. <laughs> There's, the only thing we can do to fix the situation is just like, stop, <laughs> stop meddling. Like, there, like, there's, if you have caused such a mess that you have caused, that, that the West has caused this continent. Like there's, there's like, it's, it's you're, you're, you're past the point of, of, like even like people who like try or, I would say microloans. I would, I, microloans are a great way that you can actually impact and affect an individual who's trying to improve their situation, whether it's helping a person buy seeds or um, help a person, um, you know, like buy, you know, like or whatever that they need for this, for this small thing that doesn't mean a lot to you because $20, $20 to you or me or $100 or $200 or, you know, like it's, it, it, it's, it's not so much, but to that person it could be, it could be their, their economic freedom. So I think that taking things on a really small, individual, personal level, I'm thinking more like you know, village and community. They say you know, think lo uh, think think globally, act locally. Um, having a one-on-one -on -one interaction with another human being and helping them, and like you know, they're calling it a micro loan, but like if they're not able to pay it back, who cares? Like you you gave a hundred dollars to somebody so that they could buy seeds, so that they can you know plant for a year, and that's that's a good thing that you did, and it's better than giving to. I think it's one of the best things you can do. Yeah, I, I feel you on this. The first part especially is like just stop meddling. Like the same thing's happening with indigenous people around the world that have been colonized for hundreds and even a thousand more years that, mm -hmm. have, that are now being exposed to money. They've never been exposed to money before and now they're being exposed to money. And it's just causing a lot of issues with the way that they connect to spirit. And so if we want to be good stewards, we need to actually work with the indigenous wisdom and not just plunder for economic gains. And like you said, microloans are, they're, they're, they're nuanced in so many ways. And I, I, I would be really wanting to see how the US and China and all these other countries end up like really properly healing and working with Africa's the median age in Africa is about 19 years old. It's completely different than the rest of the world. The rest of the world's like like 30, 
40 years old on average in the countries of the world. Right. So again, um, you're you're talking about Africa like it's some huge monolith, but like again, Africa is big enough to fit the majority of the rest of the world inside of. So like when you're talking about the medium age, median age of a continent, that's not really accurate when you're comparing it to countries. Um, there are some countries in Africa that have much higher median ages. There are some countries in Africa that have lower median ages. Um, another thing when you said mm. that if we're going to be good stewards, I think we need to stop thinking of ourselves or the West as being stewards to this continent and maybe trusting that if we stopped meddling that they could handle things on their own and that they don't really need our help. But if they would like it, then it should always be up to them to describe how they would like it and for us to just facilitate on their terms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's so, again, it's like, this is so weird, like so many like effective altruists and other people say that like it's so important to make sure that like some of the health issues that cause people to have um, mortality rates that are really around the world that are just that dying so young to be able to like go and help provide like insecticide treated malaria nets, these types of things are, are um, so much nuance to this and I agree with, yeah, you're, you're on point. There's there's a lot that we can learn by understanding the origins of humanity and understanding our interconnectedness. Go Back Fetch It does exactly that. What is next on the radar for Go Back Fetch It? Like, I'm gonna mm -hmm. get to experience this mm -hmm. in uh, like part one of a story. And mm -hmm. then there's, yeah, yeah. Future yeah, um, so I wanna continue building this out more. Um, I actually want to connect this to the work of um, documentarian Elisa Capé. Uh, she actually recently won the uh, Peace Prize and the Inter the Amnesty Prize at the Berlin All Film Festival this past year for a documentary that she produced called Espera Tu a Revolta. Um, and it's, it, it was between the ages of 14 and 19 of a young woman in Brazil um, when they decided that they were going to close down a bunch of schools, um, this woman, Marcella, or this teenager, Marcella, she goes through this journey of um, reclaiming her African heritage um, and actually becoming um, um, like a like a, somebody who's actually like fighting for her rights, her own rights. Um, and so like actually seeing echoes of how like this original story of Eve, who's literally having to fight panthers in the beginning of the human race is now uh, embodied in this young woman in Brazil who's still continuing to fight and move forward and to make progress and to make the world a better place for the next generation. Okay, so then it's going to go through some of these origins like fire and hunting gathering and agriculture and civilizations and also on a like how to make the world better. Um, so those are the next episodes. I'm talking about what I have um, next for to complete the prologue because the prologue still isn't complete yet. Yeah, so the ones that we, that we just said, those were the next episodes. And then so mm -hmm. the prologue completing is what you described with. Mm -hmm. so Going on the journey from um, the very beginning, what we see, we interact with, um, with the different maps. Then we get the, the data visualization um, of two migrations. The oh. first migration out of Africa with people walking, oh, the second okay. forced migration across the Atlantic. As we go across the Atlantic and we realize that Eve is somebody who's been taken from Africa and she's going to the other side. And then we land, boom, in present day Brazil. And we realize that oh, Eve is alive in this young woman in Brazil today. Oh, whoa. Okay. Okay. I'm following now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Okay. That's a huge jump because yeah. that goes, yeah, that goes to like, like, a hundred thousand years forward <laughs> like really quickly yeah yeah and yeah. I, that's another beauty of this technology being able to compress time so that people can perceive of um, actually being able to connect the dots so easily and then being able to come back and you know get to the next part of the story and then connect the dots to how that's affecting us now here today um, and that's how I kind of see the structure of this being because like if you really think about it, any any given topic like you know that the thread runs all the way through it and there's all these things that are happening along the way but it's like it's the same kind of thread so like how can we how can we move people through that thread effectively so they can see how you know all of the factors that contribute to who you are sitting here and who I am sitting here are actually connected to all these things that happened hundreds of thousands of years ago yeah yeah 
Inter interesting. So you think every one of them is going to be like a compressed time, like you're going from a hundred thousand years to, to to now, like in terms of like fire or agriculture or whatever it may be. But so the beauty of this project being episodic is. Um, First of all, we're at the very beginning of storytelling in this medium. So I'm one of the people who's laying down the groundwork for what it's actually going to look like and what it's going to be. And uh, it's, I know for a fact that it's going to continue to evolve as our sensibilities evolve, as what I'm building continues to grow and as that continues to evolve as well. So um, whether it's going to continue along the same path of compressing time along data visualizations or whether there will be some sort of new way that'll make sense for episode one and mm -hmm. then a new way that'll make sense for episode two and or even if by that place it's already a, a complete by that point it's a completely fold out fleshed out world where um, the narrative itself is something that's constantly evolving and changing with AI that's we're very early on it, it's it's this is where it is right now yeah yeah Damn, we're super excited for the continuation of the project. Holy cow. Okay, let's, um, let's ask you a couple questions that we like asking the guests on the way out of the show, okay? Okay. All right, one of the questions that we like asking is, what do you think happens before we're born, and what do you think happens after we die? Hmm. To that I would respond, we're never born and we never die. And teach us more. <laughs> Um, the idea of birth is a beginning. Um, so in that sense of birth, I would say that we have no beginning and also that we have no end. So we go through the experience of thinking we have a beginning and thinking that we have an end and then we're, we realize we're infinite and then we think that it began and then we think that it ended and then we realize we're infinite and it's a constant cycle until we decide that we want to stop going through the idea of thinking that we began and thinking that yeah. we ended and we just want to stay infinite. Well said. And then do you think we're alone in the cosmos? I think it would be a statistical impossibility for us to be alone in the cosmos. I think that um, anybody who thinks that we are has probably never gone to a place with high ele elevation and no light pollution and looked at just how many stars there are in the sky and then stop to think about the fact that those are all those stars that they're looking at are only in our galaxy and that our galaxy is just one of an infinite number of galaxies in an infinitely large universe that's getting bigger every minute every second it's getting bigger um, and if you actually just think about that for sheer numbers it would make absolutely no sense whatsoever to think that we are alone in the universe it would make no sense to think that we're even alone in the galaxy and then do you think we're in a simulation Yes. I think that um, I think that that what I talked about the simulation begins when we think that we began. But what we really are is a collective consciousness that is decided to break off into these individual fractions because we want to experience what it's like to experience ourselves and we want to collect experience so that we can know ourselves better but I think that what we truly are is one collective everything. And I think that that's also kind of at the core of what I'm doing with my project as well. So the infinite consciousness breaks off into the self that gets to have the experiences to better understand. Itself. Itself. Yes. Yeah. Love it. And then how about what is the most beautiful thing in the world? Love. But love is really the only thing in the world and everything else is an illusion. <sighs> thanks, Sherry. Thanks Thank for, you. Thanks for coming on to the show. This has been super fun. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. We're really excited for all your work with Go Back Fetch It. Thank you. Great job so far. It's been so wonderful learning from you. Thank you. We would love for everyone to give us your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. We would also love for you to check out the links in the bio to Charity's Patreon, also go back fetchit.com, as well as the Twitter profile. Go and talk to more people, your friends, your family, your coworkers, people online on social media about the origins of humanity and technology. Have more conversations about it, gain better wisdom about it, build projects using these new technologies that we have around these subjects. Huge shout out to Ron Vargas for producing and directing. Thank you very much, Ron. 
and support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the, the communities, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support them. Support charity, support simulation. Our links are below. Help us grow and prosper. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace.